So last week on the program, we talked about how Donald Trump is going to be trying to cause as much chaos as possible before leaving office. Uh, the reason, I don't know. To me, I, I view this as basically his middle finger to Americans for rejecting him, because even though publicly he refuses to admit that he lost this election deep down, he knows the reality. He knows that his time is limited. So we discussed how he is trying to make Biden's time at renegotiating a nuclear deal with Iran more difficult by imposing sanctions on Iran. But this week, we learned something much more startling. That Donald Trump was literally talked out of bombing Iran's nuclear facilities. And if he actually followed through on this, the damage that this would have caused would have been unthinkable. So as the New York Times reports, President Trump asked senior advisors in an Oval Office meeting on Thursday whether he had options to take action against Iran's main nuclear site in the coming weeks. The meeting occurred a day after international inspectors reported a significant increase in the country's stockpile of nuclear material, four current and former U.S. officials said on Monday. A range of senior advisors dissuaded the president from moving ahead with a military strike. The advisors, including Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Christopher C. Miller, the Acting Defense Secretary, and General Mark A. Milley, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, warned that a strike against Iran's facilities could easily escalate into a broader conflict in the last weeks of Mr. Trump's presidency. Any strike, whether by missile or cyber, would almost certainly be focused on Natanz, where the International Atomic Energy Agency reported on Wednesday that Iran's uranium stockpile was now 12 times larger than permitted under the nuclear accord that Mr. Trump abandoned abandoned in 2018. The agency also noted that Iran had not allowed it access to another suspected site where there was evidence of past nuclear activity. Mr. Trump asked his top national security aides what options were available and how to respond, officials said. After Mr. Pompeo and General Milley described the potential risks of military escalation, officials left the meeting believing a missile attack inside Iran was off the table, thankfully. According to administration officials with knowledge of the meeting, Mr. Trump might still be looking at ways to strike Iranian assets and allies, including militias in Iraq, officials said. A smaller group of national security aides had met late Wednesday to discuss Iran the day before the meeting with the president. So this is terrifying. You have a lame duck president escalating tensions with Iran, and had he bombed that nuclear facility, that is an act of war. Make no mistake about it, that is an act of war. So what he's doing is characterized as attempting to start a war with Iran, or at least trying to figure out if that's an option, something that's on the table. Now, thankfully, Mike Pence and Pompeo and individuals around him talked him out of that, but think about how crazy this is. When you have Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence be the grown-ups in the room, there's an issue with that. Now, in the same week that we learned about this, we also learned that Donald Trump is going to be drawing down some forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Hill reports President Trump has ordered the Pentagon to pull 2,500 U.S. troops from Afghanistan and Iraq by mid-January, Acting Defense Secretary Christopher Miller announced Tuesday. The Defense Department will cut the number of troops in Afghanistan from 4,500 to 2,500 and the number of forces in Iraq from 3,000 to 2,500 by January 15th, days before Trump is set to leave office. I am formally announcing that we will implement President Trump's orders to continue our repositioning of forces from Afghanistan and Iraq, Miller told reporters at the Pentagon. Miller also said that Trump's decision is based on continuous engagement with his national security cabinet for the past several months, including ongoing discussions with me and my colleagues across the United States government. So I hear this and I think, he has no foreign policy. His foreign policy strategy, quote unquote strategy, is completely incoherent. When it comes to some countries like Iran, he is extremely neoconservative and hawkish. But when it comes to North Korea, for whatever reason, we thought that he would end up trying to go to war with him at the beginning of his presidency, but he tried to negotiate a peace deal with them, which ironically looked a lot like the deal that the Obama administration struck with Iran, which he didn't like. But I mean, <laughs> this man is a maniac. This man is a maniac. And he is driven by self-aggrandizement, not by national security or, you know, the country's interests. 
And to this, you know, you might think, well, Mike, shouldn't we give him credit for drawing down troops in Iraq and Afghanistan? I mean, it's not a 100% withdrawal, but it's something, right? No, you get zero credit for this. You are literally doing this at the last minute of your presidency. And not to mention, you're not even bringing 100% of troops home. If you genuinely wanted credit for bringing home the troops, you do that immediately after you take office. So that way you prove to people that we don't need to permanently occupy these countries and be there even longer than we already have. I mean, what has it been like 20 years now that we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan? There is no excuse, no valid reason why we should remain in these countries. At this point, it's a full-blown occupation. It's a never-ending war. And you bringing home some troops, you get no credit for that. Sorry, because after you increased drone strikes by 400 plus percent, by escalating continuously with Iran, putting us at the brink of war with Iran this January when you assassinated one of their top military generals, you don't get credit. Like, on one hand, he wants to be viewed, like he wants his legacy to be non-interventionist, you know, uh, more intelligent when it comes to foreign policy than his predecessors, who initiated new wars. But at the same time, he's been ramping up tensions with Iran. And even though he probably tore up the Iran nuclear agreement because of partisan reasons, because Obama did it and Obama bad, I mean, still, that is an escalation. So, you know, he, he wants to be a neoconservative and a libertarian non-interventionist simultaneously. And what this looks like when you step back and look at his administration is it's all just incoherent. He doesn't really have a vision when it comes to foreign policy. You know, even if we believed him when he is, you know, talking about bringing the troops home, uh, and if he genuinely wanted to do that, his actions indicate that he doesn't want to do that. And, you know, it's why he, he said enough to where people who support him can justify either narrative. Like, if you are a neocon Republican, there's enough there there to where you can say, all right, this guy represents me. I mean, remember before he was elected, he was talking about assassinating the families of ISIS. And also, if you're a libertarian, there's enough there there to where you could say, well, look, he is less uh, interventionist than uh, other uh, you know, people running for president. There's just nothing but an incoherent policy. And really, what I'm more fixated on is the fact that he almost started a war with Iran last week. Like, it's insane. So how many more stories are we going to get with this lame duck president potentially being talked out of doing really horrible things? Like, what else is he going to do? We're getting two stories with regard to Iran. So what's next? What is he going to do to do damage and sabotage, you know, Biden's presidency before he even comes to power? What more can we expect? It's just unnerving. And uh, this is what we are going to have to deal with until he's out of office.